Hey, everybody. Welcome. 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 Uh, my name is Brenda Hipsher and Seth Resnick's here with me. Without any further ado, I just want to thank you, my friend. Uh, we've been friends and colleagues for a very, very long time now. Uh, back when I had no gray hair and uh, was just, <laughs> uh, which was a really long time ago. So thanks. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, Calibrite is uh, calibration done right. We make color management solutions that allow people like Seth and other professionals all over the world to manage their color and create their own specific vision. And we're very proud to have you today. Seth, welcome. Thank you. Um, I got my little house cleaning. My little house cleaning is the following. When I was asked to do a webinar, and, I, and pretty much I feel this way for any company, if I'm required to sit there and tell you all about some great product or whatnot, whether I use it or not, then I'm pretty much not interested. Um, what I will say about color management is that I couldn't even do this presentation without it. Um, clearly, I make sure that everything is color managed. It's critical. It's critical to my workflow. It's critical to everything I do. Calbright does a great job. That's all I'm going to say. And um, uh, there we go. So how do you become more creative? Um, a lot of it is changing your process, thinking out of the box, thinking differently and acting differently. I'm always getting asked by photographers, uh, you know, what are my sources for inspiration? How do I take a better photograph? Uh, one of the things that I always come back with is something that a uh, good old Jay Maisel used to say, and he would always start out by saying, well, um, it helps if you carry a camera. Um, and, and it's so true. Uh, thank God we have iPhones now, but I still try to really carry a camera with me whenever I'm around because you actually can't capture anything without it. What is a definition of creativity? That's an interesting starting point because according to Webster's, in order for something to be creative, it has to be an original idea. And to me, that, that really interesting word is the word original. If, and if you ask yourself, is what you're doing original, you'll know your own answer. I like to try to understand my own creative process. I write every day now. Um, that's been really, really rewarding. Um, my goal is always to push myself farther than I've ever been before. And I think for me, when I can't do that, um, that's when I'll, when I'll stop. I have a slight lag time and I'm, and I, 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 uh, apologize for that, but, um, if you look at your own images, anybody can pull up 10, 20, 50, maybe 100 images. But if you ask yourself, are they unique? Do they define you? Can other people tell that they're you? That number goes down pretty drastically and pretty rapidly. The key is to try to separate yourself from everybody else and be unique. So... When we think about photographers, how many actually have a signature? Do you have one? I have one, but that's not the kind that I'm talking about. I'm talking about more about a look or a vision. And there are so many artists that actually have a really, really visible signature. One that's so visible that the last thing you have to do is walk up to the piece and see who did it. So what is a real signature? Well, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that defines you as an artist. So when someone looks at the piece, they, they know it's you. Call it a distinct viewpoint, if you will. 
always fascinating to me that you can tell a Picasso or a Monet. And I think one of the most amazing signature artists is Chihuly, because there are tons and tons and tons of glass blowers and a lot of really good ones. But you can tell one of his pieces in, in a second. And he's so was so still is so prolific that um, with thousands and thousands of pieces, his signature still stands out. If you don't know him, you probably recognize stuff like this, um, classic Chuli, and um, you'd never need to look at that signature. Alexander Calder, you can spot his pieces a mile away. They're all distinct. They are signatures. Henry Moore, and again, completely classic, distinctive, there are so many people doing sculpture. There are no other Henry Moores. Picasso. Sort of classic. Monet. Avedon, and there are a lot of photographers that had sort of sign or still have true signature looks. Um, so it, it isn't limited to just sculptures or painters or glass blowers. There are a lot of photographers and a lot of uh, artists that have developed a look. And a lot of people go, well, I don't know if I want a signature because then it means I can't do anything else. And that's that's actually not at all what it means just means that some of your classic pieces are identified by, by your voice. I think to find your voice, one of the most important things is to not sit back and to push yourself and take chances, to take chances and actually make mistakes. In fact, fail, fail, and fail again, for me, is something I still do, and I'm proud of it. Um, Edison said, I have not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. It's my, one of the most prolific people of all times. It's 1,093 patents in his 84 years. Pretty amazing. So I continually will decide if I'm comfortable with something, um, by testing it and failing. In this case, we were flying over uh, Swakamund in Africa. And there was this, um, salt flat with, a, a a road that went through it and, uh, really couldn't get the helicopter positioned right. So I made a decision that I would try in Photoshop to alter the lines, but I'm not generally comfortable with using Photoshop in that way. Not, and especially, especially for you, Jeff, she, we, not cause I don't know how, because I, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel right. But the only way I'm going to know is if I do it. And I did it, and absolutely doesn't feel right. So that gets eliminated. Uh, I just got back from Antarctica and have lots and lots of uh, amazing images of these blue holes and spaces. But I played around with something doing a mirror image, and I actually liked the image. It's, it's, I, I find it quite enjoyable. But it's totally not me. And I, I need to I needed to fail to know that this doesn't work for me and won't work for me. Words are everything to me and understanding the words. I, I find that if I actually photograph words, that um, photography becomes a another sense and that brings us to sort of what this is all about, what I would call style and vision. And an exercise that I think really is, is useful to do to help identify your images, identify what images are important to you, what words are important to you, or to take what I would call emotional keywords. And I, I make a, I have a list on my desk, pretty much have memorized them all. And ones that are important to me, uh, I put in, in, uh, a different font size and a different color. Really interesting to take a group of what you think are 
20 of your best images and what you think they're about, and then go through and do the test. How many of these words are in all my images? Really fascinating. So I have a list of emotional keywords. I have a list of style keywords. What, what defines what my style is? And again, we'll go through and uh, still try to do the same, the same thing. And then keyword myself and see how many of those words actually that I would define for myself are also apparent in my images. I think it's important for everyone to try and write a vision statement, to actually put on paper what you think your images are of, not what they're about. It's obvious what they're about. And once you get one down, do it again, 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 and again. I'm constantly doing it. And um, I started out one of the first times I made a vision statement. I, I, it comes back to my uh, starting as a journalist and, and mostly photographing people. And I was always sort of in their face. And uh, my original uh, piece said, uh, breaking personal space. And I was actually with my business partner, John Paul, in um, the Atacama Desert, photographing a rock. And I just started laughing and I realized there, this rock doesn't have personal space, but it's entering into the space of the subject. And simply changing that word from uh, breaking to entering um, was a fascinating word. It also um, created a, a nice name for a show to be called Breaking and Entering. And write it again, and write it again, and write it from your heart. Each time trying to go deeper into what the images are really about, and then uh, testing to see if that is what your images are about. And it's fascinating to, um, you'll, you'll know right away. Write a style statement. What, are, what is the style of your images? And it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it's not something you'll do the first time. It is something that I think you can uh, keep trying over and over and over again and, and definitely come up with a definition of what your style is uh, and a definition of what your vision is. It was always funny to me to just tell people I'm, you're a photographer. And, and the responses I always got was, you know, are you a landscape photographer? And to me, the landscape photographer is somebody with a tripod. They sit there for hours. It sort of sends shivers up my back. Um, when you said you're not a landscape photographer, then obviously you were a wildlife photographer. Well, no, I, I, I'm not. Um, well, if you're not that, then you have to be a people photographer. And, and then the worst part was if you were, if all of those were sort of the answer was no, then you were definitely a paparazzi. So it became important to me to define what I really thought of what I was as a photographer. And for me, I realized that what I really photograph is energy. And it, it's an energy that I truly feel as a, as a sixth or seventh sense uh, between myself and whatever the subject is. So this is a style profile. And again, things that are important uh, that I find in, in most of my images, not necessarily in, in all of my images. A really fascinating exercise is to just take your keywords, the words that you think uh, you use, and simply string them together and see if you can make something that actually makes sense out of it. And I'll do this and, and test all kinds of ideas and, and topics of, of doing this. Um, in this case, do I select my, my subjects or do my subjects select me? And I actually think the subjects select me. Um, where, do, where does a lot of that come from? Well, I'll go back through my own history 
of growing up. And it wasn't until I did this exercise I'm about to show you that I realized illusion was really, really important to me. And I grew up with Escher uh, posters all around my room. Never realized it, never realized how important they were to me until I was much older in life. Sensuality is really something that, I, that is important to me. It's sensuality that I find naturally in nature. And um, funny story here with this particular image is that someone actually complained on Facebook and wanted me banned on Facebook for pornography. Um, how sad. <laughs> Metaphors is huge in my work. And um, in this case, um, over Namibia in one of the driest, deadest spots on earth. And there are these, um, these salt flats. And when I'm looking at it from a helicopter, it looks like, uh, it looks like a brain or a heart. Um, the word came to me, cerebral desert, which became the name of this piece. Um, but it, it's from thinking about not what they're of, but what they're really about that allows you to go uh, further and, and uh, really come up with, with those concepts. It also helped me understand my two favorite places on Earth. One is Antarctica, the other one's Namibia. Um, almost impossible to find a correlation between the two until I started thinking about they both have wave patterns. Um, and the sand blows in a wave pattern. The uh, ice forms those same kinds of patterns. They both have S curves as a skier. I love S curves. I can't stand squiggly lines. I like really uniform lines. So a lot of a lot of what our own lives are about can be found through our imagery. Again, just walking through a barrio in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and this was just someone's window. And when I first walked by, I was like, ah. And when I started thinking about it, this place is so poor and depressed. This woman took the time to put these horseshoes in the window, um, and, you know, as a form of art and a form of um, community richness. And when I went back, it sort of changed the whole way I saw this environment from being poor and depressed to being really bright and, and vivid in a, uh, a place of community. New Zealand, and there's a, uh, a beach that Every photographer that goes there shows up at way too many photographers with tripods all fighting. And um, I just walked down the beach further. And um, instead of photographing rocks, I actually had this conversation with myself of what do I see? I know they're rocks, but I suddenly thought I saw fried eggs. And when I started to photograph them as fried eggs, um, A, it was awesome because I was at the other end of the beach with no one else was around. But it was really rewarding to photograph fried eggs instead of um, these, these rocks and these boulders that everybody has tripods over. So testing your images. Do the keywords make sense? Um, are there new words that you should add? Are there words that aren't in any of your images? And all of those questions and asking those questions, I think help make you a stronger photographer. Another really interesting exercise, and some of it's obvious, go back and track who your influences are. For me, it's obvious number one was Jay, still is. Um, no great surprise there. No great surprise that Pete Turner was a huge influence of mine. This is still one of my favorite Pete images, and I have tried so many times to basically recreate this image, and every time I try it, I photograph a trash can. And he did such an amazing job with this, such a simple image, but brilliant. Susan Mizellus, another one that wasn't, was pretty obvious for me. Person, Elliot Erwitt. Miola, I don't know if he's here today, but um, he's been a huge influence on, on, on my life. Jody Cobb, one of the reasons I actually wanted to go to Japan in the first place. Eugene Smith, 
Arnold Newman, I have this image hanging up and it's to me again, it's one of the most brilliant portraits I've ever seen. Neil Leifer and, and I love technical stuff and um, just amazing to think about going to the match and first of all, what side of the ring are you going to be on? And all those guys behind are photographing Muhammad's butt. And Neil just happens to be in the right spot. But just to make sure he's in the right spot, at the same moment, he gets this incredible, incredible image. He also had a foot pedal and shot with a camera on the ceiling looking down. And I've always thought this guy really thought out every part and every possibility of the technical aspects of, of making an image. And, and it's always been a huge influence on me. Ernest Haas. This is where it gets interesting. Um, I was in Europe and I was drawn to these boats and I wasn't making very good images of them, but I couldn't stop photographing them and started thinking about why. And, and that's a question I actually ask myself a lot with almost anything is, is just a simple question of why. And it suddenly occurred to me doing this exercise that in my brother's room growing up, I had this, this painting, not the real one, of course, but um, having looked at that every day, it was an influence. The same thing with these Escher posters that were in my room growing up. And I realized that's where my, my love of optical illusion actually comes from. And being able to figure that stuff out is really, really helpful. Really interesting to test a group of images. Do Are they what you think they are? Do they represent that? Can you string 10 images together and keep a cohesive thought? So my idea of sensuality and, and especially sensuality in ice, and here's my test. And yeah, for me, they, they hold together. It opens up a lot of other doors. Gives me a good viewpoint of what I'm looking for when I shoot. When I was on this trip to Antarctica that I just came back from, it was really, really useful for me to understand what was missing and what I wanted to fill in and some of the angles that I wanted to get. Being able to go in somehow into one of these spaces was really important to me. And then it also leads to this question of, of why. And, you know, um, someone says, I like flowers. Well, why? I'll, you know, my mom liked flowers. Why? And you keep the, the more you ask the question why, the deeper you'll get into it until you eventually start to find your answers. For me, it was also where else can I find sensuality? If I, I know I see it in the ice, where else can I find it? Well, when I start asking those questions, I can find it in sand very easily. Now I have a means of, of tying together sand images or images from Africa or other parts of the world, Morocco, with images from uh, Antarctica, which wouldn't have been obvious to me otherwise. And then comes, you know, a bigger question of where else do I find sensuality? Well, gee, I can find it in a flower find it in a palm frond. I can find it in rocks. Suddenly, the whole idea of rocks became very, very different because now I wasn't just photographing rocks. Um, it, it, it became much deeper and I was photographing essentially the same things and the same feelings uh, I was in Antarctica. So, Understanding what your voice is is critical, and it also helps you put together um, some things that you might not normally think would, would go together, and to do so and take risks to figure those out. Wave patterns. Um, I had to revisit the idea of wave patterns, and 
And it wasn't until I actually showed a crop version of this to somebody and they said, wow, those water waves are awesome. Where's the water that color? And it was like, I got it. The, the obvious is not water, it's sand. But if, if I can get someone to think it's water, water and ice, the wave patterns, I can really tie these things together. I can literally take water that is ice. And um, again, you start looking for things like instead of having the boat shut down and the, and the Zodiac not moving, let's just start the engine for a minute and create a ripple and see what happens. And, and all these chances and all of these um, risks, if you will, or breaking rules, which are probably some of the most important things, uh, allow you to put the images together so they become uh, not only a sequence, but a sequence that has a, has a voice. Uh, helicopter stuff in Iceland. And again, instead of looking at... at um, just um, alluvial fans, I'm actually looking at the idea that uh, these were remind me a lot of dragons from Japan. But again, the wave patterns, the uh, uh, and tying the ice, water, and sand all together. And I find it really opens up, it opens up my point of view and, and my ability to make images that I haven't seen before by, by keeping all those words and those thoughts in my head as I'm photographing. I actually try now to go out and actually photograph the words. I also try, and I find it really, really, really important to take the image before I press the button. And that goes from the idea of um, physically taking the image to even how I want it processed and whatnot. And, and, and a question that, something that bothers me, it always has, is people saying, well, did it look like that when you shot it? And my answer is yes, 100%. It looked exactly that way in my mind. That's why I shot it. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I really believe that, um, that I have a vision. I have something that's in my head that I want to communicate. Um, and that is what it looks like. This is exactly what it looks like up here. Jeff, Jeff Shiwi actually uh, coined a phrase um, that it's in your wetware. And... Uh, it's the wetware that makes the image, not, not the camera. And, and this is correct. We, we do it up here. Um, and if I can execute that and know what it's going to look like before I take the image, it allows me to go from one thing to the next. Um, I watch so many photographers take the camera. They put the camera up, and then you first see them go like this. It's as if the very first time they're actually seeing the world around them is when they put the camera up. I want to pick the camera up and pick something off. Like I know what's going on over there. I'm going to photograph that. And then I'm going to photograph this is behind me and so on and so forth. And I already know pretty much how I want it processed. And I'm processing it essentially in my head before I shoot it. I'm always thinking about what is the story? Not only what is, what is this about, but what's the bigger story? What am I trying to communicate? So these are some exercises that you can try, um, rules, if you will, some that I learned back in art school. And I'm going to preface it by saying that the first most important rule is that there are none. But there are some principles and things that do make, tend to make sense. And some concepts that are important to understand. Our eyes are seeing all the time. We are always seeing the world around us, yet... We only actually take in 10% of what we see is what we process. A little exercise that maybe, maybe you look ridiculously uh, crazy doing, but I do it all the time, is I will just close my eyes and then try and recall what's around me. And I'll do that all the time when I'm on location somewheres, just so I am much more aware of all the little things 
that are that are around me. So some of these little exercises, and these are they're rule it's a rule book, if you will, but again, all rules are meant to be broken. But when we photograph something that has a combination of colors and shapes, what do we see first? And the answer is we actually respond first to the color, second to the shape. So if I actually make a little plot, you see yellow and blue typically before you see triangles and circles. Useful to know that because if I'm photographing something that has both shapes and circles, I mean shapes and circles, shapes and color, it's interesting to know how, how, the, how the mind is going to react to it. Smooth horizontal shapes give a sense of stability, calm and peace. Again, when people say, what lens are you going to use? Well, what the lens I'm going to use is the lens that's going to help emphasize the feeling that, I, that I'm looking for from this image. Seth, we, we have an interesting question from uh, Judy Cooper. Okay. Uh, she says, can you give me an example of the process of visualization, visualizing? I know you're doing that in many different ways, but I think she's asking for something a little more concrete. Not sh She says, not sure how you actually do this. Yeah, I'll give you a perfect example. So in all those, um, in all those pictures of those spaces in Antarctica, um, you know, people joke that I photograph vaginas and like that, you know, it is what it is. But no, that's obviously it's not what they are. But I'll see those blue spaces. And and there are several people that have been in Zodiacs that are on this. I will see some of those spaces five miles away mm -hmm. where the Zodiac driver with the binoculars doesn't doesn't even know what I'm talking about. As soon as I see that or feel that that's out there, I'm already in my head with, I want to be this tight. I know I want to, I want to use um, uh, clarity or some tool to get the, to get the edges really defined and sharpened. I want the inside to be really soft. I don't want to actually see the back of it. Um, so literally from, from seeing something on a horizon line that's, that you can't even make out just the color I'm already deciding from what lens to how I want to process something that I actually don't even necessarily see yet. And it really helps because if you don't do that and you're in this little Zodiac bouncing around the ocean and you can't get close to this ice um, and you're coming in for a pass, you know, and again, there are a lot of people here that, that have been in those Zodiacs with me. You don't, you don't know what lens to use. You don't know what, what you're looking at. You, you realize that you just missed it. Can we go back the other way? That's, that's a pretty good example of, of as best as I can explain it. Yeah, and I've got another question that goes right along with it. Uh, Bruce Wilson says, so many of the images you're showing us today come from distant exotic locations. Suppose one rarely goes to such locations. So, oh, yeah. So I took out just because of the length of time here, <laughs> but there's a section coming up of images. And one of the images, one of the series of images I was going to show um, were pictures that were made in my backyard. Okay. That were all made in puddles um, and in swimming pools and down by a lake. And they were, they were all um, crazy types of reflections, but they're made here. I, I photograph in my house. I mean, I, I photograph everywhere. It is, it is awesome to be able to go to these exotic locations, 100%. And certainly um, the inspiration that, that happens in a place like that is over the top. But I can be really inspired um, in my backyard or, or right here. And, and anyone that knows me will see me regularly, like, you know, lift a glass up or something and start, you know, playing with it and, you know, in a restaurant constantly thanks um so smooth horizontal shapes yes um so <laughs> the, the sense here is a sense of peace and again really useful to understand in framing it and in what lens i choose and where i place it the feeling that it's going to going to give to the viewer 
On the opposite side of that, um, or on a similar side to that first, when we have triangles on flat bases, those typically give a sense of peace and stability. Um, really fun to go through a museum, and I've done this several times with John, John Paul, and we'll criticize famous works of art. You know, how come he cut the corner off? How come he did this? Why is it framed this way? People look at it like you're nuts, but it's really useful to, to ask those questions and to understand some of the principles behind it. So we're in Namibia, and in my mind, I'm like, huh, triangle on a flat base. Well, there's the triangle on a flat base. I already know from an art standpoint that it's, that it's going to work. And that's really useful as opposed to thinking, you know, wow, that's neat. How am I going to frame it? Especially when you're driving along at 40 miles an hour in a Jeep. Just really, really neat to be able to go, you know, I get that. Same thing. And this was in the Atacama Desert. Um, and yes, it's a series of mountains. But what I saw was this center mountain, which is a volcano. And it's a triangle on a flat base. A triangle on a half moon gives the sensation that something's floating. And that's exactly what happened when I was with JP. Now, JP is the master of floating rocks, so I did have to stick my hand under this rock to make sure it wasn't truly floating. Um, but it was, it's, it was mind-boggling, the, the, the illusion that, that this rock was floating. But it's floating based on a principle that I have this half moon with something in it. And, um, again, really useful to know those kinds of things uh, ahead of time in understanding how you're going to compose. Vertical shapes, they're exciting, they fight gravity, uh, it's sort of a tribute to kinetic energy. So again, if I, want, if I want to make something look really bold and in your face, how I frame it, that's where my choice of lens comes from, or you know, my choice for composition. In Greek architecture, in Roman architecture, they put tops across things to give them stability. And again, really useful to understand that when I come up on this giant iceberg and I'm right underneath it, but it has a top on it, I'm back to a sense of peace and tran tranquility rather than that in-your-face concept. We read diagonals from left to right or going up and down. Try and deliver something when you have one of those lines. And, and don't always worry about things that shouldn't be there. We were in Greenland, and somebody was complaining that here we are in northern Greenland, and, um, you know, we have jet trails. Well, rather than thinking of them as jet trails, I was like, wow, the, the iceberg's shooting out a laser. And when I start photographing and feeling it that way, it takes on, you know, a very humanistic quality of this, of this iceberg shooting out a laser. Other people weren't photographing until, until there was nothing in the sky. And, and it's, again, it's really important to, to understand what is around you and what's there and how to utilize it. We're in Iceland photographing the aurora, and genius here picks <laughs> a location where we're looking directly at night at the lights from Reykjavik. And my instant reaction was, oh my God, I can't believe this. We're in the wrong spot. But then instead of looking at it as the, as the lights from Reykjavik, I start looking at it like this, almost like this uh, celestial projector, if you will, shooting out this, this light form. And the image really started working Again, breaking the rules, but having an idea and a concept, knowing that it would work because of those lines. When patterns get smaller, they create a sense of movement or a path. They add tension and energy. So you want to follow those patterns through. You know, take something like this. This is Salinas Grande in Argentina. And, and it, when you're trying to decide how to frame it, well, if it goes to the horizon line, show it to me, the horizon line, and the eye wants to go all the way through. 
Same thing here. Again, this is Bolivia. And following those lines through. Objects that are in an upper quadrant of a frame tend to give a sense of spirituality. They can represent things like freedom. So just a simple picture of, of a, a stone in the pumice stone fields, but framing it this way gives a very, very different feeling, a, a sense of spirituality, especially if that's what I'm trying to convey, just based on how I frame it. Objects in a lower quadrant can create weight or sadness. They give a grounded boundary. And again, you know, what lens are you going to use, Seth? Well, I'm going to use a lens that's going to give me this feeling of what, of, of what I'm trying to, you know, emphasize. So this looks like a sad ice. Objects on a light background feel safe. Objects on a dark background don't. And this is kind of amazing because these are the same iceberg, same series of icebergs. This is from the front. There's fog behind it, kind of looks light and airy, looks peaceful. I go around to the backside of the same series of icebergs, same exact three icebergs. Now I'm looking sort of into a stormier background and they become really dark and ominous. Same icebergs, but total different feeling based on the uh, light and dark of the background and the choice of lenses. I'm just with a curve, soft and sensual, serenity. If I can incorporate a curve when I'm photographing a sand dune or ice, I already know I'm going to be able to emphasize the concept of sensuality, which is something I'm looking for. Objects that are small are going to feel vulnerable. Well, one way to photograph ice is bold and in your face, and other ways is to make it look vulnerable. I'm using a lens for a choice of an effect, not because I'm asking, well, what, what lens do I have or whatever. I mean, I'm intentionally framing it this way with sky and whatnot, to give it that sense of vulnerability. There are a lot of stages, if you will. And when, when I say a stage, if you go to the theater, there can be magnificent set design, but without an actor, there's not much going on. And stages need actors, and actors need stages. This is one of those images that it's got everything going on from the stage standpoint, but it's got no actor. Without, without someone or something or something going on in that window, it is just not going to take a notch up further. Really useful to know that. And the actor doesn't always have to be giant in your face. And in fact, there can be lots of small actors. And in this case, the main actor is, is the actual eruption it's tiny, it's probably one thirtieth of the frame. But then I have secondary actors. I have the different colors of the, of the smoke. I've got the light on the, on the smoke. I've got the stars in the sky. And together it becomes a whole working set. Really useful to look at your own images and ask yourself that question. Do I have a stage and an actor or do I just have an actor or do I just have a stage? I can't tell you how many pictures of Slot Canyon are stages with no actors or the same actor over and over again. Um, it's hard, but, it, but it's, it becomes a critical component. Neat to get into these spaces on these icebergs. It's a great stage. I get that drop of water dropping from the ceiling. Now I have the main actor. The secondary actors are the ice under the water and the columns, but the picture takes a, a huge notch up when I actually have the actor and the stage. When two objects overlap, one becomes dominant based on light and dark. Really fascinating to ask yourself, which piece of ice is in the foreground, the white one or the dark one? And if you run your eye up and down, you can fool yourself. What will really fool you is if you look at what looks like a drip of ice from the white iceberg 
and you wonder, is it a drip of ice from the white iceberg or is it a space, a crack in the black iceberg? And the answer is the black ice is in front of the white ice. When we have a window, you want to see through it. So make sure there's something to see. And, and really simple concept. But if I have an arch, boy, it's going to help if there's something through that arch. We are naturally attracted to repetitive patterns. Really useful to know that. This is in a helicopter in, in Africa. They're old riverbeds in Greenland. And it's the repetitive pattern. We're even more attracted to repetitive patterns that have a break in the pattern. So again, this is, uh, this is in Namibia, but, but as soon as I see this pattern and then I see a break in it, really useful to know that from an art point of view, that's going to work, or at least it should. Opposite and complementary colors attract us. You can take a lame picture, which is what this is. There's nothing here. But your eye wants to like it based on the color pattern. It's, there's, it's, it's the brain wants to like it, you know, although it's a horrible image, but really useful to know that. Triangles of the corner just come classic from good old Jay Maisel and iguana. And if I look at the iguana, you know, there's, there's this triangle of space in the upper right. There's triangle of space in the upper left. There's a triangle formed in the lower left. This isn't about getting another iguana. It's just simply about watching how I, how I frame it. I call it border patrol will be politically incorrect, but look around the border for things that are crossing the border, a, a tree coming in, something coming in, they come in from the sides and they form triangles. Because if I reframe this iguana and just get rid of the triangles, it takes a huge notch up. Not, didn't take a different lens, didn't take a different iguana, didn't take different lighting, just some, simply took an awareness of getting rid of those triangles, getting in slightly tighter. Sharp edges. Really neat when we start looking at edges, and especially edges that have shadows. And mind-boggling to me, because we were in um, Africa, and um, yes, I had a little vodka or a beer at 7 o'clock in the morning. But when I got back, I looked at this photo, and I said, wait a second, that didn't happen. These are lion prints. And the lion prints look like they're coming out of the sand. Now, some of you are looking at this going, no, they don't, Seth. They look like it's um, they're regular lion prints in the sand. Well, I'm going to flop the image. And when I flop it, I change where your brain sees the shadow. And to me, that's the lion prints going in the sand. That's them coming out of the sand. You can get your brain to reverse both of these um, e either way, but uh, it's it really fascinating to understand when you have shadows um, that the sense of depth can totally be changed to being to visually look like it's um, going in or coming out. I hate when people say the light's bad. And this is a story going back to, I believe, our first trip to Antarctica. And we have 80 photographers on board. And we come up and we see the first piece of ice. And there are 70 or 80 photographers all on the side of the boat going over and over again. And there's nothing going on. The captain announces that the light's going to be going away and it's not going to be so great. So, of course, everyone listens to the captain because he clearly knows. And the light starts to change. Clouds start to come out. 
and everyone starts dropping away from the deck. And eventually, there's just a few people left up on the deck. And yeah, it's completely cloudy. And the light's horrible. And then the sun breaks for one split second. And I get this. And the icing on the cake is I look next to me and there's JP. And I have a, a 400 with a 2X converter wishing I had a 1,000. And the only thing that I wanted to be even tighter on the light on the side, and I look over, and JP has a 24 or 28 on, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, <laughs> really? Well, it's awesome to shoot next to somebody that has a different style and a different vision because there's JP's picture, and it's blow-away awesome and, and fantastic to be able to shoot next to somebody and actually ask, how they see, what they see, why they see it. Suddenly it occurs to me that there is a, a usefulness for the sky and everything. Of course, the next day, JP comes out with a long lens. I come out with a wide angle lens. To this day, we both always make sure we have a long and a wide when we, when we go out together. Optical illusions, I, I love them. Try this. This one is one of the most amazing ones I've ever, I've ever seen. If you stare at that dot for 15 seconds and then look at the at the white space, your brain will take that negative and, and change it. The best comment I ever got was somebody wanted to know what her phone number was. Jeff Shiwi just said that JP had a 14 millimeter lens. Okay, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> make it stop. Well, hard to make it stop when it's not moving, but again, these these principles and concepts are really fantastic to understand. If there's type in an image, you are going to read it. So the type needs to work. There's no way to tell the viewer, don't look at the type. But really fa fascinating to read the type and take it all in and then compose your image accordingly. Somebody else said, if I had somebody with tattoos standing up there, blocking FRO, the background would say Zen inks, and, and yeah, that would also work. But the point is, you're always going to read the type. So lately, what I've been doing is I get up early, and before I have my coffee, I just write the very first thing that comes to my mind. Um, I have a blog site. I put it on Facebook, put it on um, Instagram, and and it's um, I call it my mustings. It's, it's about everything and anything. Um, but it's been really, really helpful to help build my vision, I would say, and understand my own work more and more by, by writing every day. And the posts go from all over the place. <laughs> the last time I was in Japan, and it, it's kind of a funny story, um, I'm pretty open to try a lot of things. And JP said to me, suppose we do haiku. And little did he know that it, it sent a shiver up my back to think we're going on a photography trip and <laughs> we're going to just do haiku. Um, but I gave it a try, and I, I didn't tell him that, that I was horrified by it until, until much later. But I took it all the way to the point of actually sleeping with my iPhone and leaving it on, um, on the, the message part. And I would wake up and I would, whatever thought I had, I'd write the thought down. And then I decided I wanted to see if I go out and actually photograph the words rather than, rather than taking images and finding words to go with it. What happens if I go out and photograph the words? And it was an absolutely amazing experience to go out and take these, um, these thoughts, they weren't true haiku, they were just sort of thoughts that I came up with, and then go out and, and, and photograph those thoughts. And it made a really fantastic um, book that someday I'll, I'll redo as a real, real book as opposed to a blur book. But um, again, it really changed the way I went about the, this idea of combining images and pictures 
how rewarding it can actually be. And I write about what's ever on my mind. Um, Jeff Shewe, there's a bit of a tribute to you today and what I wrote about. So um, what I've been up to, playing around with gallery work. Um, I had a fantastic project with a guy that works in glass and he sculpted uh, from, he sculpted ice and glass and we combined it with images. And again, the idea of writing and, and writing and, and images together, I have a, uh, do a lot of work with European travel and leisure where they actually let me do both and really rewarding and fun to be able to put all of your pieces together yourself and get them published and actually get paid. So some highlights from uh, COVID times or since COVID. These are all uh, recent pictures that I just got back from uh, a week and a half ago. And again, so awesome to go back to a place that you've been in this this case, it's my was my 14th trip to Antarctica, but actually have a whole shot list composed of, of things that I wanted to get and things I was looking for that I hadn't seen before. And to be able to knock them off and just come up with another list of things for next year. One of the most amazing things that we did in this trip is it was um, we were in this place called the Fish Islands. The sun was going down. It was getting close to 10 o'clock at night with one of these amazing sunsets. And we just went out and I we shut down the Zodiacs and just listened to Antarctica. And it was mind boggling to, to hear the bubbles coming up through the ice um, and, and the sounds of water, the sounds of nature. Probably one of the one of the most amazing experience, experiences on this trip. I was really interested in weather and, and um, things like catabatic winds and orographic precipitation, and set out to try to capture that. And having a shot list was really useful. Always interested in these blue spaces. I love the idea of the underwater and the above water. And again, made a list that I was on this trip. I was specifically going to look for blue lines underwater. Um, one of the things that happens in Antarctica is some of these icebergs are so big and obviously they're cold that they form their, their own weather patterns actually form right over the, over the glacier. So, I mean, this looked like you know, like it was blowing smoke rings, but they are actually it's it's uh, it's fresh water uh, evaporating and chilling um, and the glacier smoking. I mean, the iceberg smoking. Light, you know, I, lo I love light in every way, bad, good, indifferent. Light is awesome. These are uh, the catabatic winds that they come down the side of a glacier pick up the sheer size of Antarctica is, is completely overwhelming. And I actually wrote a note to myself on this trip, try to document something that shows the size and the sense of scale. Water, the key to everything. I wanted water on this trip, and I didn't exactly know how I wanted to capture water. But I did a lot with splashes and, and color and light. The, the sense of scale, how thick the ice is in some places. 9,000, 10,000 feet. The blue, these blue spaces are literally mind boggling. 
five miles away. You start looking at mushrooms instead of ice. So it is my my favorite place, but a lot of places are awesome. And um, in particular, Antarctica, the Arctic and, and uh, Antarctica make me bipolar since I try to go to both each year. Awesome. But trying to look at it differently. Um, these were reflections in the La Mer Channel when I saw angels. Um, when I start photographing angels, instead of reflections, it, it's, it, it changes everything. So I'm from New Zealand. And sometimes again, it's just a lot, some, some things are luck. And in this case, I just happened to get two swans in the lower part and we, and we dry, as we're going by. And, you know, it's awesome when that happens. Namibia, another place that I adore, especially by helicopter. Tribute to Pete Turner in Namibia. I'm flying in a helicopter with somebody who plays a uh, organ. And instead of seeing the sand, I see a musical note and changes again everything about how it's framed and how it's put together. This is one of those images with, with the shadow. And this happens to be a sand dune and that is not coming out. It's actually going in, but understanding that really, really neat to know it before I press the button. Japan, another place that I absolutely adore. And holds a special place in my heart here. Greenland, and that's that is the blood moon. Again, fascinated with the idea of what's under the water as well as what's above it. Reflections, sometimes the water's so still you actually get dizzy trying to see what side, what's up and what's down. My idea of a polar bear <laughs> helps make the stage. And he's just a little actor. I really could care less about the polar bear. He helps, helps set the stage. And then Iceland with the uh, and again, I love helicopter work in Iceland and flying over these alluvial fans, just magnificent. So 
So I hope that was um, interesting. Seth, I, I, I got to tell you, uh, this has been a feast for the eyes, a feast for the mind, and a feast for the heart. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I just cannot tell you uh, how spiritually restful it is to not only see your pictures, but to hear you talk about them. Uh, I think we've had fewer questions in this webinar than any other webinar we've ever had. And I think that is a means it's a raging success <laughs> because everyone is just as mesmerized as I am. You know, in my living room, I have a photograph of yours that has very strong color, uh, color row houses. I'm not sure if you told me if it's Miami or Cuba. That was Miami. <laughs> and there's an, there's an old woman walking into the door. Yep. And that image has been in my living room now for over a decade. And as I age, I see different things in that, in that image. Because when I was younger, when that image first came into my life, um, I saw the, the old lady leaving where I am. Uh -huh. but now I see her going where I'm going. So it just speaks to the, uh, deep spiritual nature of photography and your deep spirituality as well. Not only your craft, but, but what you bring uh, to your photography. So my personal uh, and uh, maybe two uh, familiar thank yous publicly to you today, because you have made my day. Whoa, whoa,